please welcome Chief Technology Officer RSA Zulfika Ramzan. As reflected in this morning's opening keynote, the central theme of RSA Conference 2020 is the human element. Technology has become such an inextricable part of our lives that we rarely pause for a moment and consider that every technology, every innovation began its life as an idea in the mind of an individual. I am therefore humbled and honored to welcome to the stage five individuals whose contributions to our industry have been unparalleled. Please join me in welcoming Ron Rivest, the R in RSA. Adi Shamir, the S in RSA. Whit Diffie, Tal Rabin, and Arvin Narayanan. So, uh, Adi, I, I'd, I'd like to begin with you, since it's a bit long since we've last heard from you on this panel. Mm -hmm. uh, the one theme from this conference is the human element. And as we know, technologists today are trying to think about replacing the human element in many systems with AI and machine learning capabilities. I want to get your perspective to start with on AI and machine learning, and specifically the security implications of these technologies. Thanks. <clears throat> I'd like to start with a short personal note. As most of you know, uh, it took... Uh, uh, the administration six months last year to decide whether I should be allowed into the US or not. Finally, I got a visa. And I really uh, believe that since every other country in the world uh, makes such decisions within three to five days, uh, I think that uh, whoever is in charge of the visa application processing should be replaced by a deep neural network. <laughs> uh, coming to think about it, I think that you need only a shallow network to distinguish between me and an Al-Qaeda terrorist. Don't be <laughs> deep. Anyway, what's, uh, what are the two major problems in uh, uh, artificial intelligence, in my opinion? Uh, one is that we don't understand why they are working so well. And the second is we don't understand why they are working so terribly. Uh, <laughs> the main uh, question which is related to security, is uh, the issue of adversarial examples. As all of you have probably seen, it is enough to take an image and change a few pixels, and uh, then uh, the uh, neural network is making all kinds of very strange decisions. I think that we are now starting to understand what is going on, but until we will solve this problem, uh, I think that uh, it will be very dangerous to use uh, deep neural networks in uh, in uh, autonomous vehicles, for example, uh, in making life and death uh, decisions in medicine, uh, etc. So I believe that we are making good progress. Uh, machine learning had uh, made tremendous uh, advances over the last 10 years, but we are not there yet. There are some sticky problems. And we've seen recently the facial recognition ban, I think, is, is one interesting example of ethical implications of AI. Does the panel have any comments on, on that area? Well, maybe I could comment on that. Yeah, facial recognition is one of the places where, is it, where rubber meets the road, where we start seeing applications of AI to our everyday experience. And it's happening so fast and so pervasively that uh, you know, we really should be concerned about what are the rules of the road for, for, for this technology. Uh, and it seems that there's three or five properties that uh, are relevant here. One is asymmetry. It used to be when somebody was looking at you, you knew they were looking at you and you could look at them. We don't have that anymore with cameras everywhere in hidden forms. Uh, other is permanence, what's being seen is being recorded, and that, that's a huge change in, in, in the uh, situation. And there are three properties of Bruce Schneier, and a wonderful op-ed he had recently in New York Times mentioned as well, which is really where the AI part of it comes in. <coughs> so one of these is uh, identification, so the systems are being used to identify you as an individual. Uh, the Chinese are masters at this at the moment, you know, there are billions of people, they can identify you know, who you are quickly. So identification, correlation, correlating what's seen today with what was seen yesterday with your other activities. And finally, uh, discrimination, using this information to discriminate what ads you see, what services you can get, and so on too. So identification, correlation, and discrimination are all Im implemented by AI and need, in my opinion, to be carefully regulated. 
Uh, so I think the bans today of facial recognition are appropriate until we understand better how to regulate this technology. I just want to mention that in China they have a major failure now of the face recognition system because everyone is working with face masks. <laughs> so uh, they, they started using uh, face recognition in order to pay. And when you stay at the checkout counter with the long line behind you, you don't want to take off your uh, face mask in order to uh, actually pay. And they've also had failures before that. There was um, a famous woman whose picture was on the side of a bus, and they used this technology to try and stop people from jaywalking, and they shamed them by putting their face then on a bulletin board of terrible jaywalkers. And this woman whose face passed on the, si on the crosswalk on the bus at the time when the red was light, uh, the light was red, was posted up on that um, board of shame. So there are also failures <laughs> in that respect. But I want to say um, one um, interesting research that uh, has come out um, also shows some of these issues that relate to the learning algorithms and how we still have a ways ahead of us when it comes to security issues. Um, there are some researchers that showed that if you train um, a system to learn something. For example, they were trying to teach the system to learn facial expressions. But somehow the system also learned, and they called it overlearning, it learned about the race of the individuals. Even races that were not included in the database which they trained on. So clearly we have to understand when we run such a system, what are we learning about the data beyond what we really want to do and all the privacy implications that are involved with that. So I think that there's a good side to that. It means that maybe not all problems have been solved and that we as the security and privacy community still have a lot to contribute to the machine learning community. They're talking about putting up faces to shame people. Our founder at this conference, Jim Bidzos, had proposed that dead, the pictures of deadbeat dads ought to appear on beer bottles, so they have trouble going out drinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you think about this, this sort of large-scale mass collection of data, the topics of fairness and privacy certainly come up frequently. I know, Arvind, you spent some time thinking about this area. I'd love to get your perspective and then the panel's perspective afterwards. Sure. Uh, privacy is a, is a very overloaded term. In the technical community, we usually mean something like confidentiality. But in general, when people say their privacy is being violated, depending on context, they mean a number of different things, including fairness. Uh, and we've been talking about facial recognition. That's a good example. Why are privacy advocates up in arms about facial recognition in public spaces? I mean, my face is the most public thing about me. And when I'm in public, I don't have an expectation of privacy. So what are we worried about? Well, it's, uh, it's exactly the kind of things we've been talking about. Because of inevitable mistakes in facial recognition algorithms, the wrong person being arrested, and things like that. So those are issues of discrimination, fairness, justice, and so on. Right? So this is more common than you might think. It's the same thing with genetic privacy. What are people worried about? People are worried that a potential employer might use my genetic information to unjustly deny me a job, or my insurance company might set premiums in a discriminatory way. Again, those are issues of fairness and discrimination. And of course, law enforcement could misuse my genetic information. And I think the reason this is very important for technologists to understand this distinction is that there are a lot of very technically interesting solutions that are things like, oh, here's a way in which you can use powerful cryptography in such a way that an insurance company, for example, can query your doctor's database, not learn any of the plain text information about your uh, DNA, but nonetheless be able to compute what it is they want to compute. For example, it might be things like how to set your insurance pricing, again, in a potentially discriminatory way. Now, what have we done here? This is a very cool technology, but it doesn't actually address the concern that people have. It actually enables the very thing that they're worried about, which is discriminatory pricing using your genetic information. Right? So I wanted to just give that note of caution. When people say privacy, they often mean fairness, and so we should keep, take that into account. And cryptography is very powerful, but only if we use it in the right way. So Tal, do you think fairness can be actually achieved? So. It's an interesting um, uh, question. So for example, 
look at the following thing. Let's say we want to um, find out if um, a person would default on a loan. So what would we say? Let's, let's not use people, but let's say um, New Yorkers and Californians. And it turns out that New Yorkers default on loans more often than Californians. So should the number of a New Yorker, any New Yorker, be lower because they default more? So you would think that a bank would say, yes, I need that number to be lower. So that in some way is discriminatory because maybe I, who am a New Yorker, I'm a very upst upstanding loan payer, and then I should have a high score despite being a New Yorker. So let's say that we equalize it amongst people who do actually default, and then the number is okay. But now we look at the bank person who wants to come and give a person a loan. And they look and they say, okay, this number was equal for me and for Arvind, but in fact, she's from New York. So I know she's going to default more, even though their numbers were sort of equal a priori. So we have a tension here of where we sort of equalize between things. Do we equalize among fault defaulters, or do we equalize about New Yorkers and Californians? So there is an issue, and I think that when we design these fairness pro protocols, we really have to think what we mean by that. So hopefully we can achieve some things because um, sometimes it's great if tools can aid people. For example, the judges use uh, tools to determine whether, a people, whether people would default on their bail or not, and it helps. So maybe we need to figure out hybrid systems, but we also have to understand what property are of fairness the tools that we design are actually offering. Fantastic. Sounds, uh, sounds a lot like security, actually. It's never going to be perfect, but we still have to keep trying and do yeah. the best we can. Definitely. So from what I'm hearing, there's a lot of, obviously, technical challenges for achieving both fairness and privacy as well. Uh, we've seen a lot of recent work on the policy side. So policies like GDPR and CCPA and LGBT and others that are coming into the vogue. Um, do you think any of these policies pose interesting uh, technical challenges? Maybe I'll start with you, Tal, and, and get the rest of the panel's perspective. So I'll talk about two things. First of all is about privacy um, policies that are out there. I think that they're offering now our community a huge opportunity because clearly many of the protocols that have been designed do not offer appropriate privacy um, uh, satisfactory conditions according to these laws. So this is 2020, so we can look back to 20 plus 20 to technologies that we started developing in theory 40 years ago of multi-party computations. And I think that these technologies now can really have a huge uh, impact on what we can deliver and um, really enable us to do things that maybe otherwise we would need to give up. Um, Arvind gave it maybe as a negative example of the, of the a doctor communicating with a hospital and it's still exposing some information as it relates to fairness, but it still offers privacy guarantees that we could not achieve otherwise. So we need to use these tools um, going forward. And specifically about um, the right to be forgotten, which is one of these privacy things that people are interested in, I want to say that here we have a lot to examine. When we say the right to be forgotten, what do we even mean? It was written in the law, but the definition of what it is is not 100% clear. In fact, there's going to be a paper in Eurocrypt, which is one of our flagship conferences, where there's going to be a start of a discussion of what it means. What do people actually want when they talk about the right to be forgotten? And for us to try and start figuring out the boundaries of what we can deliver and what we cannot deliver. And here I'll just show you a simple example of why there would be a complexity. So let's say that um, Diffie posts all kinds of information online. And then I go and I query that information and I download some of Diffie's information from the stuff that he has posted and I have it on my computer. Then I ask to be forgotten. I want the fact that I had queried something about Diffie to be forgotten. Now, 
wit comes and asks for his information to be forgotten. Now, how did the search engine that gave me the results of a search, how can they access, if they forgot my query, how can they satisfy wit's requirement to be forgotten? So we see that there are challenges here that we would need to address. We would need to figure out what it means, how it will be satisfied, and so on and so forth, and whether there are conflicting requirements which can never be satisfied. So besides <coughs> the technical issues, I think that uh, the right to be forgotten simply wouldn't work. The main thing it achieves is to attract attention to the fact that someone had asked to be forgotten. There are several uh, well-known cases. Uh, one in Spain, a guy wanted to uh, have his uh, criminal record erased, and uh, so many newspaper articles were written about that particular guy who was making this particular request that uh, I'd better <laughs> not start it uh, in the first place. <laughs> On top of it, uh, there are all kinds of services such as the Internet Archive, which enable you to roll back to a, a previous state. Uh, what uh, are you going to do with it? Are you going to uh, uh, eliminate it also from such services whose main purpose is to show you what was the state of information at some uh, previous point in time? And uh, if you look for uh, a simple example at uh, what happens when uh, a Word document uh, leaks out about some government uh, action or whatever, uh, the first thing the journalists uh, usually do is to try to look at all the changes. Uh, if uh, the changes had not been uh, eliminated from that document to see who wanted to make which changes to the policy document. So I, I personally don't believe that uh, the right to be forgotten will be successful. So, Adi, I completely agree with you that the right to be forgotten doesn't actually give anyone a right to be forgotten. It's kind of a silly name. Uh, but, you know, what does the law actually try to do? So let's think about it from the perspective of somebody that the law is trying to protect. Suppose you have a criminal record. You've served your time, and now you're applying for a job. The first thing the employer is going to do, we know, is to Google you. So do you want the first impression of you to the employer to be your criminal record, or would you want the opportunity to bring it up, perhaps in an interview, on your own terms with a proper explanation and context? So that's the right that the right to be forgotten is trying to give people. Uh, some people call it the right to delist. I think that's a better term. It's a very specific right to uh, have certain search results removed from specific search queries. It doesn't take down the web page itself, and you're absolutely right about that. So going back to your example, right, this guy in Spain who had the right to be forgotten backfire against him. That was one case, but let's look at the aggregate total of right to be forgotten cases. Until recently, we didn't even quite know how many there were, except a few months ago, Google published a paper at the ACM CCS conference uh, taking a look at the right to be forgotten requests they've gotten over the years, it turns out they get 50,000 per month. 50,000 per month from all EU countries combined where they have this right. And you know that's, that's a substantial number. It's not like Google is getting overwhelmed with bogus requests. A substantial number of these requests are actually granted according to the provisions of the law. And really, the paper goes into a lot of detail. What it shows is that the right to be forgotten in aggregate, you know, ignoring uh, some special cases, is, uh, is actually working quite well uh, in enabling this right to delist certain search results for some people who want to uh, ha you know, have rights, for example, connected to their criminal record once they've already served their time. So maybe a different interpretation of the example that you gave is that this person kind of took one for the team, and <laughs> his own right to be forgotten case was splashed all over the papers. But because of that, he established a legal precedent, which actually helped those 50,000 other people per month. So that's maybe a more optimistic way of looking at it. But so I'd like to understand how a, quote, right to be forgotten can be anything other than something that kind of keeps the little people in line. Right? It's not a right to be forgotten by the secret police. It's not going to be effective toward anybody who can keep their own records. It just you know, affects small researchers nosy busybodies, employers, and we already have laws against discrimination on the basis of things like race and age that you can see clearly that affect the employers despite the fact the employers know them. So why don't we just say, you know, that if you've, if you've served your time, then an employer is not allowed to consider that in hiring you. 
can I just say one quick thing to that? So we've already had that, right? I mean, in the United States, there are you know, millions of formerly incarcerated persons, and they can't find jobs. And it's a big contributor to recidivism. So the way I look at it, we can actually use something like this here in the US. Let's do a small experiment. <coughs> Earlier, I said some nasty thing about the people in charge of uh, the visa application process. I ask for this to be forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> what was that you said? I've forgotten, Adi. I've done you the favor. But I want to say one thing. I think that maybe in the context of the right to be forgotten, we can discuss about it in various ways. But I think we do need technologies to eliminate data from the internet because, of course, there are things that we want as a society, not as the individual, to have removed. For example, um, child pornography. That would be something that would be very advantageous. Can you think about a child whose videos have been put up there? Of course, we need to do it. And I think that these technologies will never be perfect, but we do need them for other purposes. So I wouldn't just say because we cannot satisfy the right to be forgotten or maybe because we don't think it should be forgotten. I think we should work on these types of technology that enable um, deletion of information in a mass way. So what's interesting, we're seeing obviously the advent of technologies that are doing the opposite, for example, blockchain. Um, Adi, do you think uh, blockchain uh, provides a major impediment to right to be forgotten? So <clears throat> connecting this to the previous uh, issue, uh, clearly uh, blockchain is all about uh, uh, making the past immutable. So any legislation that will require that people will be able to undo uh, past uh, actions is contrary to the idea of a blockchain uh, where after a certain number of blocks had been accumulated in the blockchain, there is no way to touch the past. So all blockchains from now on are being banned, become illegal, right? Mm. Um, so in, in top of it, I uh, have uh, major reservations about uh, the blockchain technology, not because it doesn't work, but uh, in most cases, it is overhyped, and it, uh, there are much simpler ways how to achieve the same goal. Uh, there are few uh, cases which uh, uh, I'm aware of where it makes sense, and uh, it does give uh, considerable benefit. But most of the uh, uh, use cases that uh, had been proposed are just uh, nonsense, in my opinion. Now, actually, one use case we've heard about very recently for blockchain is the application of blockchain to voting. Uh, Ron, I know it's a topic you think quite a bit about, and, and what are your thoughts? I think a lot about voting, yes, though. Thank you, Zoli. Yeah, so blockchain is the wrong security technology for voting. Um, I, I like to think of it as bringing a combination lock to a kitchen fire or something like that, you know? <laughs> it, it just, you know, it's good on its own for certain things, but it's not good for voting. Voting is an interesting problem. Uh, it has requirements that are in many ways stronger than we see in many other security applications. The need for anonymous ballots, the secret ballots, uh, you know, sort of pervades the space and makes, makes it really tough to do audits and, and other things. Um, so blockchain technology doesn't really fit, and it doesn't fit for a couple of reasons. One is that we've learned that we need software independence. Many things we do in society, like flying an airplane or something, you need high tech. Voting is a place where you actually don't need high tech to make it work. You can get by just fine with paper ballots, and if you can keep that as your foundation, and if you do use some technology, use the paper ballots to check on it, you can do very well. So we call this software independence, so you don't need to trust the results because you trust some software. That's a dangerous path to go down if you don't need to go down that path. And with voting, we actually don't need to. So it, you know, blockchains provide certain things. It's sort of, I like to think of as garbage in, garbage stored forever. <laughs> Once they've had a chance to manipulate your vote, it goes on the blockchain and never gets changed again. Uh, it's just not the right tech for this. And so I, I think blockchains are a mismatch for voting. Blockchains may have other wonderful places to apply, and I'm sure Tal can speak to some of the uh, places where it fits well, and Audi's looked at it too. But voting is not one of those. Now, obviously, we are uh, in 2020. It's a major election year in the US. Um, any thoughts on the security of the election process coming in this year, given the stakes that are involved? So maybe I could speak to that again. I, I think we've learned some lessons as we've uh, come down the path to where we are today, uh, particularly in the 2000s. Uh, one of the things we have learned is what I was talking about before was the importance of paper ballots. Uh, we see that putting a foundation of trust on electronic components that are hackable is just not the right way to go. 
and having a paper ballot for every voter, a voter verified paper ballot is, is the way to go. So we, we see that. So that's one of my two top recommendations, use paper ballots. The other is to check the paper ballots, and we have technology for doing that now with risk limiting audits developed by Philip Stark at Berkeley and many others. Uh, so you take a random sample of the ballots and you can check to see if it's consistent with the reported outcomes. So these are two of my top uh, things for uh, security of elections, and we're starting to see those roll out nicely for this election coming up. I think uh, for the 2020 election, about 80% of voters will be voting on paper ballots, which is great. It's a big improvement since prior years. And uh, in particular, the swing states uh, will all be using paper ballots, so uh, that, that's a good uh, thing too. But we do have adversaries. Security is about adversaries. And uh, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we need to design our systems to have procedures in place, to have people checking other people, to have people checking machines, to make sure that the vote tallies are right. So we, we have a lot to work to do, and I hope, uh, most importantly, that everybody goes and votes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one exciting thing is, is that certainly these election security issues have brought security concepts to the main front in terms of the mainstream media covering them for the first time. Uh, there's also another recent uh, security story that came up in the mainstream media, and that was a story released by the Washington Post about a company called Crypto AG, which allegedly uh, even though it's a Swiss company, it was actually co-owned by the United States Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, Wit, I'm, I'm sure you have an interesting perspective on crypto AG, and I'd love to hear it. Um, so yeah, it came out last week that uh, this company that was the most famous crypto company in the world and was in Switzerland, a neutral, a neutral country with very strong laws about its neutrality, and it turned out to have been owned decades jointly by the Central Intelligence Agency and the Buddhist Nachrichtendienst, and was selling crypto equipment that they knew how to break all over the world. So I think I should start by saying where I'm coming from, which is I am very enthusiastic about intelligence. It's <coughs> best stated in Cold War terms that we could have imagined nothing worse than two major nuclear powers who didn't know anything about each other. So I basically celebrate intelligence successes. I have to admit I'm a Yankee. I celebrate ours a bit more than I celebrate theirs. But in general, <laughs> I think intelligence is a very valuable contribution to stability in the world. Now, what we learned from this, I think the first thing we learned is it's easy to get the illusion working in academic industrial cryptography that there's some playing fair. And intelligence is not about playing fair, it's about succeeding. And there's no reason to be sitting waiting for them to make up cryptographic algorithms that maybe you can break and maybe you can't, if instead you can push one on them that you can break. And that is what this did with amazing success for 20, 30, 40 years. Now, I think if we look carefully at this, we see two things that relate to the doctrine of this community, the public cryptographic community. One is that we've always preached that you should make cryptographic systems public. You shouldn't keep them secret. Right? And I think it's clear, this shows very clearly we were right about that. They wouldn't have gotten away with this if all of these people ha had been disclosing what cryptography they would use. But the other thing we've been preaching for a long time is, well, designing cryptographic systems is difficult. You shouldn't do it yourself. You should leave it to people like Vincent, who are good at it. And I think it's now clear that if all these little countries had designed their own, maybe they wouldn't have been terribly good, but it would have meant there been a dozen or two dozen or three dozen cryptanalytic projects that would have had to have been fielded to read their traffic, rather than had they bought the equipment from the same expert people who happen to be making compromised equipment. So these lessons are very relevant today where we're accusing Kaspersky in Russia or Huawei in China of, of building compromises into their equipment and are hesitant to buy them for that reason. And I think perhaps we should be and perhaps they should be. The only thing I don't, <clears throat> I don't understand is why do you call it news? I heard uh, this story 20 years ago. Oh. Uh, there was Hans Buller uh, who wrote a book about it. 
uh, the story is not new, but the documentation of the story is new. They got for, uh, histories written by both the Yanks and the Germans. But was there any fact which you didn't know? Um, there's a lot of sort of detail of how complex, it's easy to say, oh, we bought this company in Switzerland, right? <laughs> Doing something like that covertly is quite tricky, and I think that's, uh, get enough detail of this, it becomes much more believable. I read the story only in order to find out whether there's any hint how the uh, CIA uh, manipulated the crypto in order to make it breakable. Unfortunately, there was no information to that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been a lot of effort recently, obviously, thinking about you know, who we're going to elect in the next election and the implications it could have on, on cybersecurity policy. And specifically, another recent news item is the policy around encryption in general, and more recently, some of the debate around end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, so with kind of following up on, on your previous answer, what's your take on the current policy debate on end-to-end -end encryption, and where do you think it's going to lead? Well, when we pseudo won the argument in around 2000, I said, oh, this isn't going to go away. Everybody basically is fighting for what relative positions are going to be in an information world. And I'm, I haven't changed sides. Um, and I think that the people who, are, who put themselves forward as being concerned with, quote, law enforcement and national security have a very narrow view. And yeah, cryptography will often make their work harder. But the critical thing, I believe, at this moment, you know, even though we haven't exactly seen it yet, I kind of believe in that phrase, a cyber Pearl Harbor. And we need to do everything we can to make our systems secure. And if you build some kind of backdoor mechanism into them, it makes them just immensely more complex. And that, I think, at present, we knew, know how to be confident of the security of very simple objects. We haven't done badly with crypto systems themselves, but anything the size of an operating systems and apps and so forth, we're very poor at it. So I think we need, the critical thing we need to do is everything to make our systems secure. And I don't believe, believe, don't believe building side doors into them is going to help. <clears throat> Absolutely. This is a complicated topic and uh, as Fritz says, I think it's going to be around for a long time. Uh, there was a report which I can recommend to you all to read, which is uh, it's called uh, Moving the Encryption Conversation Forward, uh, put out by the Encryption Working Group, uh, sponsored by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And uh, it talks about the stakes, the, the various players, what, what their positions are, and how intractable the problem really is. It's difficult to see how to move forward, in any sense, whatever forward means. Um, I mean, maybe progress in some sense isn't needed. I was reminded by the conversation earlier about the right to be forgotten. I think to coin a phrase, we all sort of sense we should have a right to be private as well. So our, our, our BTP or something like that. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's a sense that we all have in a democracy that citizens have a right to communicate privately with each other using technology or, or however they wish to do out in a rowboat in a lake. So. Um, it's a difficult problem. This report that I mentioned said that you know, there are no technical solutions that are going to keep everybody happy. Uh, it's a, a problem with uh, many, many special cases. And if you want to try to think about one case where perhaps progress might be possible, it's the case of a device that's been captured by law enforcement. It's in the hands of law enforcement, and they want to know what's on that device. So it's device storage. It's data storage. It's not data communications on the wire, but it's storage on the device. So that's a, a, case, a use case where you might think about hard if you want to try to see if there's any technical approaches that would look interesting. But at the moment, we don't have any technical solutions that look uh, acceptable to everybody. So as far as we've seen, I think policies are, are certainly one uh, attempt to get uh, a technical impediment or any impediment of any sort into some of these areas. And we've also heard very recently about a, a technical impediment that's coming into vogue, namely quantum computing. Now, as many of you know, uh, if quantum computers are built to scale, then in theory they could be used to break the RIC crypto system and the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. So at least three people on the stage, I'm sure, have a vested interest in the outcome of what's going to happen with quantum computing. Uh, maybe, Ron, starting with you, what, what's your take on quantum computing and, and where do you think it's going to go? Well, my, my position hasn't really changed since last year. I think we talked a little bit about this. I hope people building quantum computers fail. <laughs> <laughs> 
It, it would mean the demise of a lovely algorithm, which uh, <laughs> we, all, we all use and appreciate. Uh, on the other hand, one has to accept the truth, and uh, maybe quantum computers will happen. Um, you know, there, there are applications of them, maybe. Uh, they seem to be mostly designed to break RSA and not much else, um, <laughs> unlike maybe blockchain, which has a wider span of, of applications. So I think it's good that we're preparing now for the possible prevalence or use of quantum computers. People are looking at post-quantum cryptography. Um, but I, I actually am somewhat skeptical about the question as to whether they'll be built, in fact. I sort of give fusion power a higher chance of succeeding than quantum computing. We'll see. Rona, you don't understand your position. Quantum computing has reached the supremacy stage. It's now, uh, we reached quantum supremacy, so you should have changed your mind about uh, the situation. So the particular, de year. the particular demonstration that was done by Google uh, did allegedly show that a quantum computer can do something that a classical computer cannot do efficiently. In fact, IBM said that it could be done still, but with a few more qubits, maybe not. But it wasn't breaking crypto, and it wasn't scaling up. There's a lot of scaling that has to be done before you can make these quantum com computers usable for breaking crypto. And that, my guess, may never happen. It's really hard. I agree. This was just <laughs> a joke. <laughs> So, you know, uh, uh, a few years ago, a very wise person, that, that wise person being Adi Shamir, uh, said on this stage that people rarely uh, break crypto, they find ways to bypass cryptography. Uh, quite recently, we've seen a lot of interesting attacks, specifically in the mobile phone space, uh, things like SIM swapping. I know, Arvind, you spent quite a lot of time thinking about SIM swapping. Uh, what's the current state of affairs, and can you share some of your recent work in this area? Sure. So we were looking at some of the rhetoric around uh, cryptocurrencies. That's how we started looking into this. The rhetoric being that it's ultra secure because it relies only on math and cryptography. And while that part is true, what is also happening is that a lot of people are losing their cryptocurrency in very, very low tech, old fashioned ways. And that brings us right back to the human element. Uh, and in particular, uh, the majority of people who have cryptocurrency store them in online wallets, which is fine if you protect your account properly. But as we know, passwords are very easy to compromise. So these online wallet services will make you get two-factor authentication, often using SMS as the second factor. Now, if there's one thing that's easier to compromise than passwords, it turns out to be taking control of your mobile account. Uh, so that's what uh, we tried to rigorously look at, four of us at Princeton, uh, Ben Kaiser, Kevin Lee, Jonathan Mayer, and myself. Uh, what we did is we wanted to see how easy so-called SIM swaps are. What happens in a SIM swap is that an attacker calls your mobile carrier, pretends to be you, and convinces them to transfer your mobile service to a SIM card that the attacker controls. Right? So now they control your mobile phone number, and then they can use that to easily break the two-factor authentication that you might have on your online services. We tried five different mobile carriers. In each case, we created 10 different prepaid accounts and tried to SIM swap ourselves. We were successful with all five carriers. All five of them were using authentication methods that are known to be vulnerable. One interesting example is that some carriers, if, uh, if you call them and you're able to tell them one or two of the numbers that most recently called you, then they're convinced that you must be the right person. But how can this go wrong? The attacker can just call the victim and insert a number <laughs> into their call log, right? So, they hadn't thought about this, so we found many vulnerabilities <laughs> of this type, and uh, uh, we published a research paper on that recently. So the one thing I would say is if you have a few minutes, and I think this is really worth a few minutes of your time, go check all of your online accounts. Make sure two-factor authentication is enabled. I'm not saying don't enable two-factor authentication, but make sure it's a secure second factor, such as an authenticator app, rather than SMS, which continues to be very vulnerable. So if I, I think the summary is security is really hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But there are things you can do. Absolutely. So you know, we, we are kind of in the last question I want to ask. I mean, it is the year 2020. Uh, so I'm curious from the panel, uh, and this is for each of you. Uh, what have been some of the most noteworthy or maybe even surprising or unexpected trends from the past 20 years? And what do you think will be important for the next 20? Maybe starting with Ron and working our way down. Sure. I, I guess the older I get, the more I see things keep changing. And I, I guess being prepared for change is, is the main message that, that uh, we've, we've learned here. So there's new technology, right? Quantum computing is coming on, online, maybe. So we have new technology. We have new math, fully homomorphic encryption, perhaps. 
Uh, we have new environments. Smartphones have really changed the game. Uh, Arvind was just talking about some of the technologies there. Uh, we have new adversaries in the upcoming elections. It may not be the Russians that are the biggest threat, but it may be the coronavirus. You know, so we'll see. So there, things, things keep changing. We have to be prepared for change. And uh, you know, it takes time to prepare for change. It takes 20 years, I think, to get the technology from a whiteboard to a product. Uh, three more years than the patent lasts, which I think is maybe related somehow. So uh, we need to keep preparing for change, building up our expertise, uh, getting ready for things that could be wildly different than we expect. So the technology, the adversaries, the math, all of that keeps changing. I think uh, uh, one of the important uh, successes of the last 20 years had been the uh, successful introduction and deployment of AES. Uh, this is related <coughs> to the uh, prize that uh, had just been given. I think that uh, it uh, um, did a wonderful job in uh, securing our systems. However, I still have a, a bit of uneasy feeling about uh, the number of rounds in AES. The way we usually design crypto systems is to design something uh, with a number of rounds uh, up to the brink at which we can no longer break it, and then add a margin of safety by, say, doubling the number of rounds. So if I look at uh, AES, let's do it in reverse. Let's take the 10-round AES and uh, have it and ask how much security is there in half of AES, five-round AES. And I've been banging my uh, head uh, against this uh, uh, question over the last few years, and the security of half of AES had been going down and down. And uh, this year, in a few months, I'll be presenting a paper at Eurocrypt uh, in which we uh, show that uh, half of AES can be broken with 2 to the 16 time and data, which is absolutely nothing. It's uh, something that uh, can be done in a fraction of a second or a few seconds. Go ahead. So um, I believe that uh, um, we violated the major um, design criteria that we need reasonable margins of safety against uh, developments in the future. And uh, uh, in the past, uh, such uh, overconfidence uh, led to uh, failures. For example, in the design of DES, uh, it was marginal to begin with. Um, the NSA knew about differential cryptanalysis and therefore knew how to break 15 out of the 16 rounds of DES. And uh, they assumed that uh, 16 rounds will give them uh, f security, while later developments uh, reduced the complexity of breaking DES, full DES, to 2 to the 43. And uh, um, I think that uh, if uh, we could roll back to the year 2000, uh, I remember at that time I gave the advice that the number of rounds should be increased to at least 16. I still stand behind this 20-year suggestion. Um, well, I think what impresses me about cryptography is how it goes on and on. Right? I mean, I've been saying for years, you know, my late wife used to say a couple of hundred years ago, an Irish wolfhound did the worst thing any Irish wolfhound could do. It killed the last wolf in Ireland. And since then, the breed has been more decorative. But I thought circa 2000 that, so to speak, we'd solve the problem put in American terms, you know, the sweet B algorithms seem to me to be satisfactory, and I still think that's far and away the solidest part of information security. And I thought cryptography would sort of, you know, wither away as a research field. But every year it surges up, and I think that, you know, the thing that impressed me most was the rise of blockchain and Bitcoin, and thousands of people going to conferences that only existed for a year or two. And so I'm just uh, amazed with the, uh, the durability. I agree with everything that uh, Wit said. And in fact, I want to enhance something about the blockchain. What amazes me about that thing, which is definitely one of the things that happened in these 20 years, is that it went back and it took things that we have known since the 80s. Byzantine agreement, hash functions, 
and um, proof of work and combined all these things. So this is another thing that I love about this field, that it can go and go into the past, bring things from the past and make them into magnificent and wonderful things of the future. Maybe blockchain, we're still lacking the killer app. Maybe everything can be done better using some other technology. But even if it was, just for the introduction, for the fact that almost every person in the world knows the word crypto, which it did not know um, uh, 10 years ago. Even it changed meaning a little. Yeah. <laughs> completely. I have to tell you, at uh, Crypto 2018, I was the general chair. And one of these kids who's 20 comes up to me and he says, this conference is not about crypto. How dare you use that name? <laughs> you know, and uh, to tell him that the, this conference has been around from long before he was born. So definitely <laughs> with a changed meaning. But I think that this is the power of this field and it really brings um, beauty to all the things you can go and you can keep on designing. And as Ron said, but also new technologies like fully homomorphic encryption, obfuscation, things that maybe today we don't even know 100% what to do with them. But maybe in 20, 40 more years, uh, we will know much more. And I think that I don't see it dying in the near future. So I see a future for everybody here for a long time. Julie. I want to give a shout out to differential privacy, which, uh, as you may know, is a technology to release a data set while protecting <coughs> individual privacy and still allowing aggregate analyses to be possible. It's about 15 years old for most of this duration. It's been a relatively obscure technology, but now it's facing its uh, first major public test, let's say, because it's being used by the 2020 US Census. Um, so in this process, you know, going from something obscure to something that we're all going to be relying on, uh, it's been interesting. There are, there's been a lot of misinformation around it. The craziest one I've heard is that differential privacy is actually a conspiracy by the Trump administration because they've secretly figured out a way to break it and they are uh, selling us a false promise of confidentiality in our, in our census responses. Uh, well, that's not true. Differential privacy long predates the Trump administration, also comes with a mathematical proof. But the bigger issue here, I think, is that what needs to happen is for every technologist inventing something really cool like differential privacy or quantum computing or whatever it is, we probably need something like 10 people whose role it is to explain it to the public and to policymakers, and more importantly, figure out how our public institutions need to change to best adapt to these technologies and minimize the harmful effects. Um, you know, not lobbyists. We need neutral people to be doing that. That's something that I think we're, we're lacking today and something which I hope we can figure out in the next 20 years or so. So I guess it all comes down to the human element. Please join me once again in thanking our amazing panel for an insightful discussion. <laughs> <laughs>